1924, a new Grand Prix car first appeared. It was destined to become the most successful racing car of all time. Designed and constructed by an Italian living in France, who called it simply his Type 35. His name, Ettore Bugatti. From 1924 to 1930, 350 Bugattis flooded onto the racing circuits of Europe, enabling France to assume a dominant position. There then followed a three-cornered struggle between France, Italy and Germany, which was to produce some of the most exciting racing ever seen between Grand Prix cars which have become legendary. Bugatti had been the early pacemaker, and during the 30s, the cars raced on in the hands of amateur drivers. Yet how Bugatti had created the car remains an enigma, for his previous designs had given little hint of what was to follow. The Type 29, for example, which was entered for the French Grand Prix at Strasbourg in 1922. The meeting was over 500 miles, and the muddy circuit was in an appalling condition. The race developed into a duel between Bugatti and Fiat. The Bugattis were doing well over 115 miles an hour on the straights, but their brakes and road holding still needed development. Two of the Fiats had dropped out, but Nazaro's overtook the leading Bugatti to win the race, as this contemporary print shows. The next year, Bugatti decided on a fully streamlined car. It was unkindly dubbed the tank. The tanks were certainly fast, but their wheelbase was too short, and they handled badly on the fast circuit at Tours. Consequently, Seagrave, on a British sunbeam, won the 1923 French Grand Prix. At the end of the year, the Bugatti tanks were sold, and he produced a completely new car, the Type 35. It's difficult now to reconcile the appearance of this most elegant car with its unlikely forebears. The beautifully constructed two-litre engine had eight cylinders in line, a straight eight. It was fed by two simple carburettors and produced a modest 90 horsepower. The secret of the Type 35 Bugatti lay in its workmanship, together with excellent steering, brakes and suspension, all of which produced unsurpassed road holding for its day. The pleasing body, which set a trend for racing cars, might have been influenced by the 1923 Fiats. Nevertheless, when the new Bugattis first appeared for the 1924 French Grand Prix at Lyon, they created a sensation. Among the opposition was another new car, the Italian P2 Alfa Romeo. But Seagrave's sunbeam led from the start. Before 100,000 spectators, the sunbeam broke the lap record, but then began to misfire, allowing the Alphas to overtake. The new Bugattis, which had been going well, also unaccountably began to slow down. Fredericks loses control. Viscaya runs into a stone wall. At the Bugatti pit, the reason for the accidents is clear. Tire failure. 
The new and much admired Bugatti alloy wheels had been designed with the idea of making brake adjustments quickly. But, always original, Bugatti had specified a non-standard tyre size and the batch hastily produced for the race had proved faulty. The Fiat's too drop out. And so, with the Fiat's, Sunbeam and Bugatti's out of the running, an Alfa Romeo driven by Campari wins. In those days, they drank the champagne. Seagrave Sunbeam had finished fifth, its misfiring traced to faulty magnetos. This is Seagrave's 1924 car with one of the surviving Lyon Grand Prix Bugattis. The Sunbeam seems lacking in refinement, but in one way it is the more technically advanced. Its engine is supercharged. The first successfully supercharged engine was the American Miller 91 with its large centrifugal blower, geared from the engine to 50,000 RPM, forcing the mixture into the cylinders. But such compressors are only efficient at high speed. At Indianapolis in America, there are gently banked curves. The cars run flat out for the entire race. The supercharger boosted the speeds up to 150 miles an hour, but the overstressed engines often failed, causing catastrophic accidents. The Sunbeam was the first European Grand Prix car to be successfully supercharged. It drew a petrol air charge from the carburetor, compressing it and pumping it into the cylinders to supercharge them. The blower used differed from the Miller centrifugal type. It was far more efficient consisting of two figure of eight paddles intermeshing, rather like an egg beater as they compressed the fuel mixture. The Roots compressor, as it's known, possesses the virtue of efficiency at low speeds. It could pressurize the induction system even when the engine was idling, enabling the Sunbeam to accelerate cleanly away from a slow corner, which a centrifugal supercharger could not do. After the disappointment of Tour, Seagrave won the Spanish Grand Prix, the last time a British car and driver would win a Grand Prix for the next 30 years. Bugatti declined to countenance supercharging, declaring it unsporty. There might, however, have been another more practical reason as Hugh Conway, the Bugatti authority, explains. Bugatti was a strange mixture of, uh, of instinctive designability and lack of technical competence. And he certainly wasn't able to design a supercharger himself. In fact, in the end, he got somebody else to do it for him. But he objected, one suspects, because he hadn't got one available and he would have been handicapped. Uh, it, it was as a result of not having one. In 1926, the formula changed to one and a half liters supercharged. Even Bugatti knew that he would have to use a compressor to remain competitive. His blown one and a half liter cars easily won the French Grand Prix that year for the very good reason that the only cars entered were three Bugattis. But in the wings, there were other contenders, principally the straight eight Delage. The Delage was a completely new design. The supercharger was driven from the crankshaft, drawing the mixture through a large carburetor. But the intricate engine, which incorporated no fewer than 60 ball or roller bearings, proved costly to produce. The last race of 1927 was also the last Grand Prix held at the Brooklands track. A Delage driven by Benoit won. It was the end of the unpopular one and a half litre formula. Because of the cost, the days of factory support were drawing to a close. Only seven straight eight Delages were ever built.
Until 1928, Grand Prix racing was to Formula Lieb, which produced some unlikely contenders, such as this four and a half litre Bentley. Bentley's sports car had won the Le Mans 24 hour race in 1928. To try to repeat this feat in 1929, a supercharger was added, which boosted the output of the engine from 125 to 240 horsepower. The blower Bentleys, as they were called, did not win at Le Mans. But Sir Henry Birkin entered a stripped four and a half litre Bentley in the 1930 French Grand Prix at Pau in southwest France. The Bentley, number 18, towered above the field. Birkin on the Bentley passed the pits at around 130 miles an hour and overtook car after car to the amazement of the crowd. Only one Bugatti, driven by Philippe Etoncelin, remained in front of the Bentley, and the fastest lorry in the world, as Bugatti is reported to have called it, came second. Etoncelin, the winner, was driving a factory-entered Bugatti. What kind of contract would he have had? Hugh Conway. It's quite clear an awful lot of the drivers uh, asked if they might drive and actually paid their own expenses in order to drive racing cars in those happy days. Uh, one or two of them uh, had some sort of contract, although we know for a fact that people like Chiron used to get given cars rather than money, which they were then able to sell. Uh, I don't think many of the drivers at Bugatti received much in the way of a fee. There was no shortage of Bugatti drivers during 1930, but the Type 35's engine, though then supercharged and enlarged to 2.3 litres, only had a single overhead camshaft, and Bugatti realised it was becoming dated. Well, he knew by 19, the end of 1929 that he was being outpassed on power. That was quite clear. And there's a complicated story, but he did acquire a couple of American Miller cars, which had been left by an American in Europe, and took them to pieces and, in fact, copied the engine exactly in a version of the 35 called the Type 51. And that produced about 30 more horsepower than he'd ever seen before for a given size of engine. The Miller engine had a double overhead camshaft, one for the inlet, another for the exhaust valves set at an angle of 90 degrees, improving the gas flow and thus increasing the power. The new engine was fitted to the Type 51 Bugatti. Horizon invited Grand Prix driver John Watson to test a meticulously restored example. The engine, certain performance, the engine is very impressive. It's got what I would call lusty power, and it really does pull from low down. And uh, I never really got it running at its maximum RPM, but you can feel that sort of thrust and, th and urge, which is very impressive. Um, the gearbox that I find a little bit difficult because I'm not so used to this kind of gearbox, but uh, otherwise it's very pleasant indeed. The thing that I felt driving it was uh, how much harder it is to drive because you have to drive much more physically and uh, on my shoulders, I mean, after the few laps around here, having to pull the wheel around, uh, I felt really worn out and uh, I can't imagine how they drove for the length of time they did do many years ago. At first I was very nervous about it, but now that I'm more accustomed to it, 
that I can understand why the owners of these cars enjoy them so much. You know, the more I've been driving it, the more I'm beginning to enjoy it, and it actually feels like a car, um, rather more than maybe the current Grand Prix cars do, because they are very much more refined. Brooklands in Surrey. Until 1933, the only British circuit. The races were mainly for sports cars, which had to be silenced. Local residents insisted on that. But the Bentleys, Bugattis and MGs raced round the bumpy banking most weekends. It was all the greatest possible fun. Look, here's Dumpy coming. Thrilling kill win. Brooklands is no more. It closed in September 1939, forever. A K3 MG, which often raced here, drives along one of the few remaining sections. The passenger is Bill Boddy, editor of Motorsport and Brooklyn's historian. That record was 143.44 by an aero engine, Napier Railton. John Cobb said it felt like leaning too far out an upstairs window, further, further than you wanted to lean out for comfort. He was a pretty placid man, so if he said that, he must have, you know, been thought of it slightly fraught. Neither the drivers nor the select summer crowd at Brooklands cared much about Grand Prix racing. That was a European sport. Most of the races here were handicaps. No previous experience was necessary. You come down here on a weekday and pay 10 shillings to go around anything you like. I came with my mother once. We went around in 1928, I think, Armstrong said Sydney 14. It wouldn't do more than about 45. All the tyres fell off after about 100 yards or, you know. But they didn't worry a bit. And I'm quite sure at the end of the day, they didn't even count the heads. I mean, if you'd had an accident somewhere and you were in the ditch, I think that's where you'd probably have stayed. It's all terribly carefree. But not always. To keep a Bentley at 130 miles an hour on the banking called for great skill and judgment. A single error could lead to disaster. The Tunis Grand Prix of 1933. A Bugatti is harried by the Italian Alfa Romeos and Maseratis. The cars are driven by an entirely new generation of professional drivers who sell their skills to the highest bidder. Like the winner of this race, Tazio Nuvolari, destined to become one of the greats. In 1932, Bugatti had not achieved a single major victory. Sadly, the time had come for his beautiful cars to make their exit, to become a legend. A legend which lives on for surviving Bugattis worth around £120,000 apiece are raced still.
1934, and Maserati have produced a new 3.3-litre car. It was built to the international formula which began that year. There was no restriction on engine size or supercharging, but the total weight of the car, curiously without the wheels, fuel or driver, was not to exceed 750 kilograms. Bugatti competed with his Type 59, which was virtually his last Grand Prix car. Though beautifully constructed, it retained such outdated features as cable-operated brakes and was powered by what was essentially a sports car engine. Although riding mechanics had long since been banished, the Type 59 remained a two-seater and, eccentrically, was cranked from the side. The rising cost of construction by 1934 was such that Bugatti was never able to develop the Type 59. By far the most successful of the trio was the Type B Alfa Romeo. The car had been steadily developed over 10 years. With the capacity of its superb supercharged straight eight engine increased to 3.2 litres, it was at the very peak of its development. Like the earlier P3 Alfa, which it closely resembled, the Type B had the classic monoposto, or single-seater driving position. John Watson tested this, the final development of the classic racing car that had first appeared ten years earlier as the Type 35 Bugatti. It's a three-speed gearbox. Uh, first is straight up, then round and up is second, straight down for third. Are we just going to use second and third today? Just stick just to second and third, that'll okay. be enough. Fuel valves here on the left, vertically yeah. up is on and the mag switch is over there on the right as marked. The two rev counters, that's a strange thing to have. Well, tradition. Um, they read roughly the same. Ah. OK, John, right, have some right. fun. Thank Stick you your boot in. Oh, I'll do my best. This Alpha is still capable of 150 miles an hour, so John Watson takes no chances. It's a very impressive car because it's very powerful. And to imagine that drivers, Nouvelari in particular, drove these cars at Nürburgring in circuits like that, which are extremely bumpy, and the car hasn't got a sophisticated suspension, it just puts into perspective how good those drivers were in their day. Really, you only need two gears, second and third gear, because it's got so much torque, so much low down power. A thousand revs in second gear up to five five the limit that in any corner a heaven bend you just go into it and put the throttle on out it shoots there's no need to go down to bottom gear to get it out of a corner if you could take this kind of engine engine response and put it in the current car would be fantastic but there was another competitor to be considered germany in 1923, this German Mercedes had won the Sicilian Targa Florio. Until 1934, Germany had been excluded from the French and Belgian Grand Prix, and the last new racing car that Mercedes had produced was in 1926. So a radical modern design was clearly essential for the 750 kilogram formula. Work began in 1933. Soon, in the Mercedes-Benz racing department at Stuttgart, craftsmen began meticulously to assemble a prototype engine to power the new car. It was designated W25, and unlike the contemporary French and Italian contenders, owed little to the past. The engine was initially 3.3 litres and supercharged by a large roots blower, pressurising the carburettor, creating the characteristic scream of these cars. Even in its early form, the straight eight engine produced over 400 horsepower. The body was carefully streamlined to reduce drag. And independently sprung wheels offered the road holding required at a speed of 175 miles an hour. The gearbox was in a unit with the back axle, 
which soon became universal for racing cars. The W25 was not the only German design. At Chemnitz, Ferdinand Porsche had designed for Auto Union a most unusual rear-engined car, commonplace now, but unexplored territory in 1934. Auto Union also began construction in 1933. The firm was a consortium created by Hoch, Funderer, DKW and Audi. The car had a V16 4.4 litre blown engine producing 300 horsepower. It was tested on a rolling road. When driven on the track, however, the handling was suspect. The international debut of the German cars was at Montlhéry near Paris for the 1934 French Grand Prix. The Mercedes team manager, Alfred Neubauer, leads a superb team which is confident of victory. Chiron on the Alfa Romeo had made a flying start to lead the race. An auto union is soon in trouble. The fast banked Montlhéry track reduces the advantage of the superior cornering possessed by the German cars. Fagioli on a Mercedes twice breaks the lap record but can't catch Chiron's Alpha. And after only 10 laps, von Brachitsch is in the pits. German radio stations are relaying the race live, but only bad news is coming in from the course. Neubauer knows the race is lost. All three Mercedes and the auto unions retire from mechanical breakdowns. Their drivers reduced to spectating from the pits. The French crowd are delighted as the popular Louis Chiron wins. The press begin to dismiss the German comeback into Grand Prix racing. But in Stuttgart, at the end of the 1934 season, the Mercedes team are greeted as heroes for the races which they did win. The German Eiffelrennen, the Coppa Acerbo at Pescara in Italy, and the Spanish Grand Prix. The opening race of the 1936 season was at Po. No German cars were entered. This was the kind of racing for which the 750 kilogram formula was devised. Relatively low powered Alphas, Bugattis and Maseratis. There was also a new four and a half litre unsupercharged French Delahaye driven by the veteran Etincelin. Which one? <laughs> Monaco, Easter 1936. The weather will not be as bad again until 1984 when the race will be abandoned. But that's out of the question in 1936. Bernd Rosemeyer's auto union crashes, as do several other cars. Somewhere in the rain, Nuvolari, in a new 3.8 Alpha, is trying hard. But only one driver is capable of mastering these appalling conditions. Mercedes Rudolf Caracciola. It rained also in the Eiffel Mountains with the Eiffel Renan, 
held on the 14-mile Nürburgring circuit. Mercedes drivers try hard, but the mist closes in, and Auto Union's rising star, Bernd Rosemeyer, appears through the gloom to win. Nineteen thirty six was really Auto Union's year, and a concerned Mercedes Benz engage a brilliant young German engineer, Rudolf Uhlenhaut. I joined the racing team at the end of the season, nineteen thirty six, and this is the car we began to develop for the season nineteen thirty seven. We built ten cars for each season. They are the legendary W125s, with the engine enlarged to 5.6 litres to produce 640 horsepower. But to keep within the 750 kilogram limit, it's lightly built and rough running. As long as the engine was rough, we knew it was all right. But if it became smooth, we knew that the crankshaft had begun to crack and it was time to put in a new one and a new driver, the young Englishman Dick Seaman, whose first drive for Mercedes was at Long Island in New York for the Vanderbilt Cup. Nuvolari had entered with the new V12 Alfa Romeo, which proved no match for Seaman's Mercedes. But an auto union driven by Rosemeyer wins. Rosemeyer, an ex-motorcyclist, is the only driver to really master the early auto unions. For many, 1937 is regarded as the greatest year ever for motor racing. The German cars are so powerful they can spin their wheels on a dry road up to 150 miles an hour and can touch 200. The power of these cars won't be exceeded until the advent of the turbocharged Formula One cars of the 1980s. Tires alone limit the maximum performance. Pit stops are frequent. For 300,000 German spectators in that high summer of German technology, the only question was, would the winner be an auto union or a Mercedes? In the German Grand Prix, the answer was Mercedes. Driven by Caracciola. Seen in this unique colour footage, it was shot in 1937 by an English photographer, George Monkhouse, who recounts his impression of the German teams. Tremendous. Just the sheer efficiency of the whole shooting match when it arrived on the starting line. I mean, everything worked about them. When they put the starter in the front, it started. There was no nonsense. Manfred von Brauchitsch, the Mercedes driver, and Tazio Nuvolari in his famous red helmet, who's now driving for Auto Union. The brilliant Bernd Rosemeyer and his Auto Union. Mercedes Alfred Neubauer. Caracciola adjusts his mirror, watched by his wife Alice, who's keeping the lap charts. The race that George Monkhouse photographed was the 1937 Pescara Coppa Acerbo, and we see the race from the pits. Team manager Neubauer, with his red and black flag, brings in Caracciola for a routine pit stop. German pit work has become legendary. The cars are averaging only three miles to the gallon and have a capacity of 88 gallons. Four wheels are changed, and a mechanic tests the temperature of the exhaust manifold, looking for a cool one which will indicate a misfiring cylinder. All is well. The 
The screen is cleaned and Neubauer sends Caracciola on his way after 26 seconds. In the heat of the Italian summer, Rose Meyer's auto union has tire trouble, but wins the race. Von Brauchitsch comes in second. And Dick Seaman fifth. In those days, the drivers dressed casually and few wore crash helmets. A week later, George Monkhouse is at Bremgarten to film these British ERAs. These one and a half litre cars had first appeared in 1934 and competed in voiturette races, roughly equivalent to today's Formula 2. Number 58 is driven by Prince Bira of Siam, a well-known pre-war driver. This is one of his cars. ERA stood for English Racing Automobiles, and 17 of these one and a half litre supercharged cars were built. They were very successful. They were fitted with a semi-automatic pre-selector gearbox. Most of the ERAs had beam axles with leaf springs bound with cord for rigidity. The success of the one and a half litre cars did go some way to make up for the lack of a true British Grand Prix car. But at last we had a Grand Prix circuit, Donington Park, where the 1937 season was to close. Mercedes and Auto Union fielded full teams with only nominal opposition expected from British cars, as the newsreels acknowledged. From the start it's clear that the German cars are going to run away with the honours. Four times as powerful as the British entrants, they easily leave competitors behind. The pace grows faster and faster, pushing on to an exciting climax, with the winner's average speed at 82.86 miles an hour. The Donington crowds had never seen anything remotely like it. Rosemeyer won on an auto union. Donington was the last time the six-litre cars were to be seen. A new three-litre formula came into force in 1938. Mercedes produced the W154, a V12. It incorporated all the experience gained over four years. It had cost millions, subsidized by the German government. At Stuttgart, money was never a problem. I could have as much as I wanted. Nobody said I was spending too much. I don't, I don't even know what we spent. The V12 engines alone reputedly cost £7,400 each in 1938. They were built to the highest standards, as was the entire car. The road holding was certainly the best that could then be obtained and would be difficult to improve on today. Few Grand Prix cars have surpassed the purposeful lines of the 1938 Mercedes. The first race to the new formula was at Po, with a field including two Type 51 Bugattis. Dreyfus on Adela Hay leads with Caracciola uneasy in the new car. And Herman Lang spins off. This shot, though cut into the contemporary newsreel of the race, was in fact taken in practice, the car being too damaged to start. A new three-litre Maserati, fast but frail. Dreyfus on Adela Hay wins, Mercedes finishing second. It would be a very different story at the French Grand Prix at Reims. Achtung! Fünf, vier, drei, zwei, eins, los! Caracciola makes a poor start. The Reims circuit is very fast. The new Mercedes are soon lapping at well over 100 miles an hour. But Caracciola is still not at home in the three-litre car. And the three-litre auto union seems to have inherited some of the handling problems of the earlier cars. Sadly, auto union are without Rosemeyer, who'd lost his life in a record attempt earlier that year. 
The race became a demonstration run for Mercedes-Benz. Von Brachic drives faultlessly to win the French Grand Prix at an average of over 101 miles an hour. The decadent French start their races with a flag. At the Nürburgring, a light system is used, which fails to work. But they're off anyway for the 1938 German Grand Prix. Von Brachic, anxious to win his second Grand Prix, is in the lead as he comes in for a routine pit stop. Fuel is pumped into the cars at five gallons a second. Mistakes are inevitable. This happens to von Brauchitsch. A spark, and his car is on fire with 88 gallons of fuel on board. Neubauer drags him out. Efficient firefighting puts out the blaze as Seaman leaves the pits after his pit stop to take the lead. Von Brachic insists on rejoining the race, but he was to run off the road shortly afterwards, with the Englishman, Dick Seaman, now leading the German Grand Prix. Seaman and Blank beherrschen nun überlegen das Rennen. Im großen Preis von Deutschland 1938, Doppelsieg für Mercedes-Benz. Sports leader Hunlein is not pleased. And even Dick Seaman seems embarrassed. It's also very unlike dear old Donington. Where a huge crowd had turned up, drawn by the stories of the German invasion the year before. It's October, and just three weeks after the Munich crisis. The German teams are uneasy and almost pull out. Uhrenhalt and Neubauer receive direct instructions from Stuttgart to race. Not unnaturally, Dick Seaman is hoping for another win. The Duke of Kent is formally greeted by Hunlein, clad in English tweeds for the occasion. a new, very fast Maserati. Uhrenhaut told George Munkhaus that if the Germans had prepared them, they could have won. A French Delahaye, it looks old-fashioned, but so do the English perpendicular ERAs. The popular band leader and very good amateur driver, Billy Cotton, is to drive one. Nuvolari is to drive an auto union. War three-mile Donington circuit was very narrow and very bumpy. It's well known that the German cars have every advantage over the other entries. Billy Cotton, number 18, finds the tempo pretty hot as he swings round the bend. Seaman, Lang and Miller take a chance and get away with it. But after all, that's bound to happen in a race like this. An English car engine blows up and oil is spilled onto the track. The first victim is the auto union of Hasse. Dick Seaman follows in his Mercedes, but he will be able to restart. surprised to find Nuvolari number four in the lead. Driving with all the skill that has made him world famous, he goes on to win at an average speed of 80.49 miles an hour. Even on this sinuous circuit, the three-litre cars prove almost as fast as the previous six-litre cars. In search of yet more speed for 1939, 
Auto Union have revised their cars. The driving position is moved back to improve the handling. The V12 engine is modified to give increased power. A two-stage supercharger is fitted. That's one supercharger pressurizing another, boosting the power output from 420 to 485 horsepower, giving Auto Union a speed of 195 miles an hour. Only two auto unions survive in the West, one in Munich and this one in England. During 1939, the German teams were as invincible with the three-litre cars as before. They won every major Grand Prix in that last year of peace. The power and the road-holding abilities of the three-litre Mercedes is such that a new cornering technique is evolved, the four-wheel drift. John Watson. Basically, the car is being steered by the use of engine power balancing the slide and powering the car through the corner. The weather at Spa was very bad. Dick Seaman was leading but misjudged a corner and crashed, fatally. Herman Lang won but there was no joy in his victory. Possibly the greatest technical achievement of 1939 concerned these, the one and a half litre Alfa Romeos. Uhlenhout had admired them at Pescara. The Italians, determined to win at least one Grand Prix, had at only six months' notice restricted the Tripoli meeting to one and a half litre cars. In those six months, Mercedes designed and built two one and a half litre V8 engine cars. It would have taken most teams longer than that simply to prepare existing cars. It'll come as no surprise to learn that the German cars were first and second. In five years, the Germans had achieved total domination of international Grand Prix racing. All opposition was eclipsed. While it's true that the National Socialist government had funded the teams primarily for reasons of propaganda, it is also true that money alone can never guarantee success in motor racing. The German achievements, like those of Bugatti 15 years earlier, were due to superior technology. The silver car's last race was in Belgrade on the 3rd of September 1939, two days after the outbreak of the Second World War. Oh.